You were created to know and enjoy God. You were called to be in community so that you can become all that God desires you to be. God designed you with a purpose so you can be the difference in this world. And we exist to help you on that journey. Graceway. Hey everyone, my name is Tylena and this is my friend, Pastor Donovan. And we want to thank you for joining us today. We are wrapping up a series called Taste and See where we have examined what the Bible teaches us about food. Today, Pastor Tim will be looking at the significance of lamb in the Bible and culture. I hope you enjoy it. Tylena, I gotta say, I am so super pumped about our outdoor service. Sunday, September 13th at 4 p.m., we will be hosting a worship gathering on the Graceway ball fields. We are keeping in mind everyone's safety, so masks and social distancing will be implemented. You can register for the event by going to visitgraceway.org slash outdoor service. Yes, awesome. Pastor Donovan, you know, our family is stoked for this. I cannot wait. Hey, wherever you're watching us today, please take a moment and click the subscribe or follow button so you can join us again next week. Now get comfortable, grab your favorite drink as we dive into this week's message. Hey, Graceway, Pastor Tim here. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're excited for what God wants to do, what God wants to say, not only to us, but to you. I wanna ask you to give us a follow, give us a like, give us a share, depending on what platform you're using, but it's a great way just to involve people in what God's doing here at Graceway. A couple announcements for you before we get going. We're incredibly excited about our outdoor service coming September 13th at 4 p.m. up at our ball fields. We're gonna to continue to do social distancing, continue to expect you to have masks on, but I know, man, I'll be honest with you, whenever uh, we made the decision back in March to stop doing in-person, I had no idea it was gonna take us this long to even begin to conceive of being back together. And so I'm excited to see you, uh, excited to worship Jesus with you and hope that you will plan to do that. We do need you to register just because of the amount of space that we have. We wanna make sure that we can keep you distance and keep you safe, but September 13th, at 4 p.m. We're gonna to continue to do the online services that Sunday morning so you can connect with us that way. But I want you to come out in person uh, at four o'clock on the 13th. Uh, second thing, we're starting a new series next week. We typically at this, uh, at this time of the year take the survey that we gave you at Easter uh, to answer some of the questions. And we call the series you asked for it because you did. Uh, we're changing it a little bit this year and we're calling this Asking for a Friend. <laughs> there are some things that are going on in our world. There are some things that I know are going on in your home, in your heart, in your mind, that, that maybe you feel a little bit weird asking somebody. So we're gonna try to answer some of those questions for you. We're gonna talk a little bit about our uh, election season. We're gonna talk about COVID. We're gonna talk about race. We're gonna talk about family dysfunction and forgiveness. And we're gonna continue in the midst of all of it to talk about God's purposes and plans for you. It's gonna be an awesome series. I'm really excited about it. And so the hope that you'll join us for that as well. Speaking of the season that we're in, can I just pastor you for a minute here? The longer this goes, the harder it gets. And so I just wanna share with you some things that, that, that are, are reminders that I've said to you before, but that to be honest with you, my counselor said to me the other day, that just kind of recalibrate me to what's going on in this season. My counselor has, has a phrase and it's this, there's, there's gold buried in this hill. <laughs> there's gold buried in this hill. I know it sounds a little hillbilly, but here's what he means by that. Wherever God has you walking, there's a treasure that he has for you. And right now we're in the middle of a season where God's teaching us some things, even though we're separated, even though we're disconnected, even though we're anxious, even though we're frustrated, even though we have things that are going on in our heart and our mind, our economy, our culture, our church, that are difficult for us, I just wanna ask you to continue to lean in to your walk with God, to continue to take those walks on a daily basis or a couple times a week, and just be asking God what he's trying to teach in. And I do also wanna say this to you, I, I'm gonna ask you to be a little bit more intentional, not only about what God's up to, but around what the enemy's up to. Because I, I hope that you know, anytime God's at work, the enemy's at work, and anytime the enemy's at work, 
God's at work. And I think that we're getting a master class right now on the enemy's intentions for our culture, the, the intent to divide and to distract and to discourage and to destroy. And I'm afraid sometimes in the church, we get looking for God, but we're not looking for the enemy who wants to steal, kill and destroy. And so I hope that you'll lean into those things. I, I thank you so much for your patience and for your grace. In the midst of this season, I'm gonna have to continue to ask you for it, but we're believing and having faith that God's gonna continue to build his church and COVID's not gonna do a doggone thing about it. So here's what I wanna do. Today is the last installment of Taste and See. I've really enjoyed studying through uh, this series. Uh, have learned a lot about culture and culinary arts. I grew up in a home where we were expected to say grace. We were expected to give thanks before every meal. I grew up in a home where I wondered as a kid what would happen if I opened my eyes while my parents were praying. Would my head just explode on the spot? Would God strike me dead with lightning? I never knew. I was always just too afraid. I maybe just give a little bit of a squint, but never a full-blown opening of the eyes because terrible things would happen, right? Uh, we would give give thanks. We would, we would express grace to God as a family before every meal. And I, I want to I want to start this last installment by answering why we do that as Christians, by answering not the close your eyes while you pray part. I, I, hey, hey, kids, uh, here's the deal. We just want you to be quiet while we're praying. That's the reason we tell you to close your eyes, okay? But, but what is, the, is there a sacred value to us giving thanks before our meals? It's interesting, as I've gone through this study and as I've, I've, I've read a lot about different kinds of food, I, I've been again and again uh, noticing two things. One is how disconnected I am from where my food comes from. Uh, if you're like me, I go to Price Chopper or Hy-Vee or, or, or Whole Foods or, or wherever you go and, and I just go down an aisle and it, and it has prepackaged, nicely packaged uh, for me, the food that I'm going to get. I don't really know where that food comes from. Uh, the second thing is, is just the amount, the abundance of food that we have in this country, the disconnectedness and the abundance. I, I read a couple of statistics that said that the waste ratio for Americans is between 30 and 40%. In other words, I grew up in a home where we had to clean our plate, right? As a culture and as a country, we leave between 30 and 40% on our plate as a regular rule and practice. It's an incredible amount of waste. And, 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 and there's really no place that that is the most prevalent, uh, that, that the discrepancies show up the most uh, other than, than meat. Uh, today, we're going to talk about meat. Today, we're at a butcher shop. Uh, called uh, the local pig. Uh, Pastor Jeremy and I are going to go up and we're going to partake in some of the of the goods, the commodities provided by this butcher shop as soon as I get done running my mouth, which is going to be shorter because I'm hungry. Come on, somebody. But the thing that's interesting about meat in America compared not only to the rest of the world, but to history is that meat has historically been a luxury. It, it has not been something that's been a part of of the regular diet. Uh, it, it is not something, if you go to developing countries, that, that is a typical mainstay. Uh, certainly not three meals a day, maybe not even three meals a week, maybe not even three meals a month. In the developing world and in the ancient world, cows were the most valuable uh, livestock. They were the most valuable because, because they not only offered meat, but they offered, they offered milk. And, and when they were ultimately butchered, they offered they offered leather, right? And so they were the most valuable, but they were the least common. The most common was sheep and goats because they also offered milk and meat, but they were smaller and took up less space. And so in the Bible, when you see things like in Genesis 13, Abraham and Lot owned a lot of livestock. If you were reading that in the ancient mind, what you heard was Abraham and Lot had an incredible amount of land to house the livestock. You see, in the ancient world, if you had a cow, you had to have the land for the cow to be taken care of. It was incredibly expensive. And so whenever Abraham and Lot had a lot of livestock, what the ancient mind would have heard is they have an incredible 
amount of land. And it got me thinking about one of the most quoted verses in the entire Bible. One of the verses that you see on coffee cups more than any other coffee cup. It's this in Psalm 50 and verse 10. God is speaking and he says, for every beast of the forest is mine. And here it is. And the cattle on a thousand hills. God says that he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Now as an American, because I'm so used to abundance and because I'm so disconnected from my food, I kind of shrug my shoulders and say, is that a lot? That sounds like a lot, right? Like, cool, God owns a lot of land and, and that's great. But in the ancient mind, a thousand hills was an immeasurable amount of land. And to say that God owned the cattle on a thousand hills meant that God owned exponentially more land to take care of all of those cattle. You see, we hear it as a numeric value because we don't really think about where our food comes from because we always have so much food. But in the ancient mind, the psalmist is saying, not only is God powerful, but God has an innumerable and immeasurable amount of resources. Anybody that has that much land is incredibly and immeasurably powerful and has all of the resources that you could ever possibly need. Now, I know in the grocery store, we don't think about this, but I, I want you to think about it this way. Have, have you been discouraged lately? Have you been discouraged about the things that are going on in our world, in our election process, on social media? Or have you been discouraged about the inability to get together as a church? I certainly have. Here's what the psalmist is wanting to remind. When I'm discouraged, remember who your God is. Remember how much he has. Remember what he's in control of. Remember that he has all of these resources and all of this power. It's immeasurable. Have you been worried lately? I've been worried lately. We're, we're trying to figure out the school situation with our kids, trying to figure out the best decision for Graceway, trying to figure out social distancing and masks and vaccines and who's gonna be our president and how's this gonna go? There's a lot of things to worry about right now. And the psalmist is saying, your God owns the cattle on a thousand hills, man. I know you're worried, but God's got it. Maybe you have a scarcity mindset. I, I grew up in a home, a good home, uh, raised by a single mom. We didn't have a lot of things. And I realized shortly into my marriage that I had a scarcity mindset. Here's what that basically means. I tend to assume that I'm not gonna have enough. I tend to assume we're not gonna have enough money. We're not gonna have enough food. I'm not gonna have enough time. I'm not gonna have, some of us in the church, we, we go around and in the name of modesty and humility, it's really a scarcity mindset that we forget who our God is. Our God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. And that scarcity mindset is actually a lack of faith in who God is and what God has and what God wants to use that he has for your blessing and for his glory. And so here's what I, here's what I realized as I was studying through this whole Taste and See series. I, I realized that I'm, I'm disconnected from my food and it's the reason that it's easy for me to waste, right? You think about fast food. I just I don't know, I just drove through the drive-thru, they handed me some food and I ate whatever I ate of it and I threw the rest away, I, I wasted it. And a lot of times the reason that it's easy for me to waste is because I'm not honestly grateful because I don't acknowledge who that comes from. I don't acknowledge that somebody had to raise this. I don't acknowledge this. Somebody cared for this and somebody invested this. I just think of it as a package that I pull off a shelf. I don't, I certainly don't think God is providing this for me right now and because i'm disconnected and i waste and because i waste i'm not grateful and when i'm not grateful i tend to worry if there will be enough listen to me i'm disconnected so i waste i waste because i'm not grateful and when i'm not grateful i tend to worry this is the interesting thing about the spiritual economics is that when i'm not grateful for what i have i worry if i have enough if I'm not grateful for what God's given me, I worry about whether or not he's going to take good care of me. And so watch, watch what my parents were trying to teach me as a kid. Every meal you sit down, acknowledge who gave you this meal. God gave me this meal. Acknowledge that it ultimately comes from God and tell him thank you that he gave you this meal Ask him for your daily bread and trust him that he's going to continue to take care of you. Trust him that he's got you. Don't worry because our God is a God who owns a thousand hills. My parents were trying to teach me a holy practice to regularly say, this meal right here comes from God. This meal represents a God who loves me. This meal represents a God who takes care of me. 
I can trust him not only with this meal, but with my hopes, my desires, my dreams, my past, my brokenness, my shames. And I know because of this food that I can taste and see the goodness of God. I am so thankful when I feel disconnected. I have a God who reminds me just who he is. Odds are we have all felt disconnected lately. And in those times, it's important to reach out to someone. If you would like to pray with a pastor, call or text us at 816-423-2877. And our team will set up a time for you to talk on the phone or video chat. You know, when we give generously and tithe out of what we've been given, we get the privilege of being an active part of the life change that is seen around Graceway. You can join us in that life change by going to visitgraceway.org slash give. So we're outside of the butcher shop now, another amazing neighborhood in our city, the River Market neighborhood, and just uh, thankful to the, to the businesses that are allowing us to use the space. You might get some background noise. Don't worry about that. We've loved coming to you from different uh, parts of our city. What a, what a great city we live in. Uh, so if you're reading down through the Bible, there's a number of stories that uh, are probably familiar to you that, that meat is a bit of a, a, a bit of a co-star. <laughs> Whenever we read the story in Luke 15 of the prodigal son who goes off and, and, and wastes his father's uh, inheritance and his, his father's uh, assets. Uh, when he comes back, what does the father do? He throws a party and he kills the fattened calf. He kills the expensive livestock that he would have been taking care of, that he had land to provide housing and food for that fattened calf. He, he kills it to celebrate his boy coming home. Whenever King David has that terrible uh, affair with Bathsheba, when he, when he kills her husband Uriah, when he refuses to repent for about a year, the prophet Nathan comes to him and he tells him a story. And the story is of a man who steals a poor man's sheep and David loses his mind and orders the man to be executed only to have the finger torn turned toward him and and, and and he's the one who's stolen something that isn't his. It's interesting because when we talk about our culture, uh, beef is really the star of our culinary scene. I, I mean, I, I'm by no means a vegetarian. If, if you are, I'm, I'm sure Jesus still loves you and we, we could figure out other things to agree on. But yeah, I'm a fan of steak. Uh, in fact, just saying the word steak gets my mouth watering and we as americans consume an incredible amount of of steak and of beef and of hamburger when we think of grilling out we, we think of we think of cows but the developing world and the ancient world and, and and the biblical story is less about cattle and beef and and more about about lamb uh, you can make the argument that fish is a little bit of a star in the gospels but lamb shows up especially throughout the entire old testament so a couple interesting things about lamb lamb it's actually a German word, and when they started to say the word lamb, it means a wee sheep, and they would enunciate the B. In other words, it wasn't lamb, it was lamb. You can see why we dropped the B, right? But Americans, we consume less than a pound of lamb a year. New Zealanders consume almost 60 pounds of lamb a year. And if you just take an easy reading through the Bible, you see lamb show up again and again and again. In fact, our first parents, when they disobey God and eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it's a lamb that God kills to cover their sins. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Noah, all had experiences where they offered up sacrifices to God. That Their worship involved meat. It, worshiped, it involved taking uh, one of their assets, one of the things that would have rep represented economic value, and it was a sacrifice in terms of what happened to the lamb, but it was, a, it was a sacrifice in terms of the economic value, and it was their way of repenting to God. It was God's way of symbolically showing that he covered their sin for a period of time, and so they would again and again go through times where they would they would kill lamb. And we get to the book of Exodus and, and at that tenth plague that God unleashes on the Egyptians is, is that he's going to kill the firstborn. And he tells the people of Israel, the Hebrews who are enslaved, if you want me to spare you, I want you to take a spotless lamb. It would have been a one-year-old lamb. It can't have any blemishes on it whatsoever. I want you to kill it, sacrifice it. Again, a sacrifice economically and a sacrifice in the act. And I want you to apply the blood to the doorpost of your family home. I want you to cover your family in the blood of a spotless lamb. 
later when the people of Israel in the wilderness and the tabernacle shows up, you see livestock being used in worship all the time, but especially lamb and especially sheep. There are times when burnt offerings are the consumption of, the, the destruction of, the burned in flames. The whole thing had to be gone. That was the way that we worshiped God. There were guilt and sin offerings that certain internal parts were burned and the meat was left for the priest to eat. If you had a fellowship offering or a peace offering, their liver and the kidney were burned, but the person who brought the offering and the priest would share a meal together uh, to commemorate the sacrifice, to commemorate the worship that had been given to God. On top of all of these daily sacrifices, often of lamb and of sheep, you would have had annual feasts where we would have tons of meat and we would celebrate the provision of God. We would acknowledge that God is the one who allowed us to do the work to take care of these livestock, to consume these livestock for our, our nutritional value. And it was a multiple times a year on top of historic celebrations. Think about this whenever Solomon dedicates the temple to God, the tabernacle becomes the temple. God's going to permanently reside with his people and they celebrate it by killing, think about it, 22,000 cattle and 120,000 sheep and goats. Think just about the butchering of this party. This was a ridiculous and incredible party. You think you've had some good backyard barbecues here in the great city of Kansas City. You ain't got nothing on the Hebrews in the wilderness when the temple finally begins to take shape and they celebrate through lamb. They celebrate through sheep. Now, let me be clear about this, that we think of, because we don't have a lot of access to or exposure to sheep, we think about just a lamb. We count sheep to go to sleep, but it was a very particular kind of animal that God chose. It was it was a lamb that couldn't be more than one year old. And the reason for that is interesting. Up into the time that a lamb turned one year old, it was not it wasn't in the in in the outside of the red for the family. You were still it was still producing things that you needed. But as soon as it turned one, it was more expensive to have the lamb because of how much it consumed. And so, a, a one-year-old lamb was at its premium value to the family. At the age that it is worth the absolute most, God says that's the one that I want. And they had to be completely spotless. God didn't want a broke down lamb. He didn't want a beat up sheep. They couldn't have had sores and a busted leg and a, and a funky ear, right? At the premium value with no blemishes, God says, that's the kind of lamb that I want. All of these sacrifices that they're doing, a one-year-old lamb who's completely spotless. Now you think about that for a second. You say, why is God so picky about his meat? Why is God so picky about what kind of lamb and how old it is? Why is God literally saying to the people of Israel, I want you to give me your absolute very best? And there's a story in the book of Genesis that kind of points us in the right direction. We meet a guy by the name of Abraham, and Abraham is promised. God walks him out to a field and says, Abe, I'm going to make an incredible nation out of you. In fact, I want you to look up to the sky. There's no light pollution, right? And I want you to start counting the stars and that that lightscape, that starscape is the equivalent to the nation that's going to come out of you. Here's the problem. Abraham and his wife, Sarah, didn't have any kids. And so God is not only promising a nation to Abraham, but he's promising a family to Abraham. Years go by. Abraham is 70, 80, 90, 95, 96. He, he's in his upper 90s by the time his wife, Sarah, gets pregnant. She's she's with all due respect, she's an old woman, right? And this miraculous fulfillment of the promise of God to Abraham and Sarah is, is, is brought into reality in the person of Isaac. Isaac is the one and only child that Abraham has, and he's a testimony to the faithfulness of God and to the faith of Abraham. And in Genesis 22, God says to Abraham, I want you to take that boy that I gave you. I want you to walk him up on the mountain. And I want you to sacrifice him to me. What? This, this, my boy, my only boy, and not only my only boy, but this boy that you promised you would give me a nation out of. And, and what does Abraham do? Now, I'll be honest with you. I, I love God, and I would like to think that I would give him my kids, but I'm not sure. Abraham loads up the donkey, loads up his boy, and goes up the mountain. He creates that alder. He puts the wood out. He gets his knife. He sets his boy on it. He raises his hand to sacrifice in every way his only son 
on a mountaintop to God and God stops him. And an interesting thing gets said in Genesis 22 verses 13 and 14. Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked and behold, behind him was a ram, a male sheep caught in a thicket by its horns. And Abraham went and he took the ram and he offered it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. And it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. It's interesting. In some of our translations, in the King James translation, it, it literally says, God will provide himself a lamb. I want you to think about this picture. A father who goes up onto a mountaintop and offers his only begotten, his only beloved son, his promised son, so that he can make a sacrifice that does what it is intended to accomplish. And God instead provides a spotless lamb. And Jesus shows up on the, on the scene in the book of John, chapter 1 and verse 29. He's kind of walking toward a crowd and a guy by the name of John the Baptist sees him coming. And I want you to see what he calls him. The next day, he, that being John the Baptist, saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, a lamb is an interesting thing because a lamb is the most vulnerable animal on the farm. It, 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 it's the most helpless. It's, 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 it, it's the most open to attack. And, and here's, what, here's what John the Baptist is saying. Here comes God who's made himself vulnerable. Here comes God who's made himself weak. Here comes God who, who is allowing himself to be used. You see, the lamb in the Old Testament isn't God just being picky in a culinary sense. God's trying to paint you a picture. God's trying to paint you a picture of, of the exact kind of high-priced, extravagantly valuable, completely spotless kind of lamb that will ultimately come one day and be sacrificed on a mountain based on the will of a father to accomplish what the father needs for the blessing of others. I hope that story sounds familiar to you. That's the story of the gospel. Jesus is the lamb who makes himself vulnerable. Jesus is the spotless lamb. Jesus is the one who comes into the world not to cover our sins, but to take them away. Think about that for a minute. Think about what's happening in the world right now. We don't need somebody to cover up our failures. We don't need somebody to cover up our shames and our guilt and the things that we wish weren't true about us. We need somebody to deal with them permanently. And Jesus comes into this world after this picture has been painted of these spotless lambs. And the claim that is made is that he comes to take away our sin. Now, lamb is an important thing on three fronts. The first is this. When you look at lamb in the Bible, lambs are always being sacrificed. And when we look at Jesus, it's important for you to know that Jesus volunteered to make himself vulnerable, to be sacrificed so that he could give you something so that he could give you grace, so that he could give you forgiveness, so he could give you freedom, so he could give you flourishing, so he could give you a new start. Why would he do that? Because he loves you. Because that spotless lamb loves you unconditionally. Because God has plans and purposes for you, but a, a, a price has to be paid. And that's the second thing that I want you to understand. Lamb was expensive in the Old Testament. Lamb represented the best that somebody had to offer. Livestock wasn't how we think about it. I go to the store and I just pick it up off the shelf. This was something that had been nurtured and cared for and invested in. And God says, give me the very best that you had. It was expensive for God to send his son, the Lamb of God, into the world. I think sometimes because we're disconnected from, our, from so many things in our life, we forget how much things cost. It's the reason that we waste things. It's the reason that we worry about things because we forget that things are expensive. And there's nothing that is more expensive than the only begotten son of God who made himself vulnerable and sacrificed himself so that he could do number three, an invitation. Here's the thing that's so interesting about lamb and about me in the Bible. It's always an invitation. It's always a party. Again and again and again, you see a king saying, I'm going to throw a huge party. I'm going to invite everybody to celebrate something. You see a dad celebrating his son coming home. You see the celebration of the temple. You see the celebration of God's goodness and of God's provision. You see in the Bible, meat was always an extravagant, expensive, sacrificial invitation to celebrate something. And this is what I want you to get out of this series, Taste and See, that God went to incredible lengths at great expense and sacrifice to himself to invite you 
into his family, to invite you to receive his love, to invite you to receive forgiveness, to invite you to receive freedom, to invite you to live the life that he created you to live. It wasn't free. It's, it's, it's free to us because he paid it through the life and the death and the burial and the resurrection of the Son of God, the Lamb of God, his name is Jesus. And all throughout the Bible, God's trying to paint a picture of a payment that he made to invite you for free into a relationship with him. If you're a follower of Jesus today, I hope that you remember how much God loved you, how much God paid to have you, how much God continues to pay to offer you grace, what had to be accomplished in and through Jesus. And if you're not a follower of Jesus, man, I'd love to talk to you because I know how much God loves you because I know the plans that God has for it, because I know how stressful and how worrisome and how difficult these days are, because I don't want you to go through them alone and you don't have to. God loves you. God has a plan for you. God has a heart for you, and God wants to walk through this and all seasons with you, because that's who he is. Let me pray for you. God, I love you today. And I thank you for this series that I've been able to enjoy, tasting and seeing of your goodness, tasting and seeing of your grace, tasting and seeing of the sacrifice and the expense that you paid to have a relationship with me. God, my heart is for us to celebrate that for those of us who are Christians and for those of us who aren't God, for your spirit to draw us into a relationship with you, for the goodness of who you are, for the fullness of who you are, the love that you have for us that we can't get anywhere else. God, would you accomplish incredible things, even in this online service for your glory and our joy. And we thank you for it in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. I'm going to go have some beef. I love you. I miss you. By God's grace, I'll see you soon. Thank you so much for joining us today. If you're looking for a way that you can deepen your relationship with Jesus and discover how you can make a difference in your community, I want to invite you to week one of Grow Track happening online next week at 1030 a.m. and 12 p.m. Grow Track is the way to get connected with what God is doing at Graceway. To get started, go to visitgraceway.org slash growth track. You can join us from anywhere on the globe. We hope to see you there. And if you're in need of prayer today, give us a call or text us at 816-423-2877. We'd love to set up a time for you to pray with one of our pastors. Also, you can still register for the outdoor service online at visitgraceway.org slash outdoor service. But before we go, let me pray for us. Father, I thank you so much for this day and for your love and your mercy and your grace towards us. I thank you for this church, for Graceway, God, and how you just continue to meet us here week after week and we can enjoy fellowship with one another, even online. So Lord, we give thanks today. And God, I pray for our service that'll be outside and I just ask, Lord, that you would bless it and that you would go before us. I pray for my friends today, um, God, that you would just remind them of their identity and how they are secured in you and how they will overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. And so I thank you so much for our eternal destination in you, God. And so we bless you and we bring these things to you in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. We hope you have an incredible week and we'll see you next week when we kick off our new series, Asking for a Friend. <laughs>